selected these six poets because they're some of my favorite. Some of them are new favorites to me. The first one I'm going to talk about is Emily Dickinson. Of course, you may be familiar with her. She was born in 1830 in uh, Amherst, Massachusetts, and she was born to a very strict uh, Victorian family. Her father was uh, the treasurer of Amherst College and later on uh, the president of Amherst College. Uh, she had a brother, uh, Austin, and I'm mentioning this family because it's important, the siblings. She had a sister, Lavina, and uh, Austin had uh, married a woman named Susan. Uh, she attended Holyoke uh, Female College, and she was a very fragile uh, young woman. And at 17, she returned home because of health reasons. Uh, she was one of the finest lyric poets in the English language. Uh, she published her first uh, poem in 1858, and it was there were two of them. It, first one was called Safe in Their Alabaster Chambers. I don't know if you heard that of that one. And the other one was I Taste Liquor Never Brewed, which is a really strange title for uh, a young woman's poet uh, poetry. Her poetry focused on a human passion, although she never married. Uh, there are uh, kind of uh, things that say that she had a lover, two lovers, but it's never really identified who they were. It's kind of uh, maybe hinted at who they were, but we really never know for sure. In later life, she wore only white, and she was very reclusive. In fact, she was so reclusive later in life, there are stories of people only talking to her through the fence. And later then, as an older woman, she never left her bedroom. Uh, she wrote 1,800 poems that were never published until after her death. She wrote uh, many poems to her family and her relatives. And I mentioned her family because it's very important because the family was so close-knitted and they had very strict Victorian values. And her family came apart because a woman came into the family, the name was Mabel Todd, and she attached herself to the family. She was a, a wife of one of the professors at Boston College. She came into the family and attached herself to the family. She became very close to all of the family, especially Emily and Susan, who was the wife of Austin. And this is an important thing because Austin, who was later on the president of uh, Amherst College, had an affair with Mabel Todd. And this brought the family to an extreme crisis. And this crisis is what they think the reason that Emily became reclusive. It, it kind of blew the family apart. And what happened after that, because of this uh, family coming apart, and this Victorian uh, re family is so intertwined with each other that this had to do with why her manuscripts uh, were so difficult after her death to publish, because this Mabel Todd attached herself to the family and also to the manuscripts. So after her death, Mabel Todd took, the ma took many of the manuscripts that actually belonged to the family. And she and her daughter took the manuscripts and published them. So, and Susan, who was the wife of Austin, was betrayed by this Mabel Todd. So there's a lot of controversy about Emily Dickinson's manuscripts. Uh, later on, uh, Susan, the wife of Austin, 
Uh, her, she actually published many of the manuscripts too, but she held on to them until 1914. So these were written back in the 1858, but weren't published till 1914. So this, if you read about Emily Dickinson, you're going to read about this whole controversy about her manuscripts. One of her favorite poems and most uh, famous poems is Hope is the Thing with Feathers. And I want to read really quickly because I want to move on to our next poet. This is a famous poet. It's ranked among the greatest poems in the English language. It is metaphorically describes the hope as a bird that rests in the soul and sings continuously and never demands anything even in the direst circumstances. And so you can, I'm not going to read it for you, but it is one of her most famous uh, poems. Hope is the thing with feathers. So I'm going to move on to our next poet, who is Frances Ellen Harper. I chose her because uh, she had a lot to do with uh, poetry uh, during uh, the Civil War. She was born in 1925 to free parents. She, uh, the, her parents died leaving her an orphan. She was three years old. And she was taken in by her aunt and uncle uh, who were abolitionists in Massachusetts. And she published her first poetry when she was 20 years old. And that poem was Forest Leaves. Her second book of poems was titled Miscellaneous Subjects, and it was published in 1854. In 1858, she refused to give up her seat or ride in the colored section of a segregated trolley in Philadelphia, which was 97 years before Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat. Nothing was ever said about it. Her most famous poem is Slave Mother, about how a child was torn away from its mother's arms. Another one of her famous poems, and I have heard of this one, is Bury Me in a Free Land. And I'll read the first part of that. Make me a grave where'er you will, in a lowly plain or a lofty hill. Make it among earth's humblest graves, but not in a land where a man is a slave. So that is one of her famous poems. So these, these are poems about what went on during the time of slavery. She was instrumental in fighting for black women's rights and gendered stereotypes about the difference between black women and white women and the scientific thinking of the day that women were, black women were cast as Jezebels. She was not recognized in the women's suffragette movement because she was alienated because of white feminism, which gave priority to white women over all women. So she isn't mentioned in the, white, in the women's suffragette movement. Ella Wheeler Wick, Wilcox. Now, I, I chose her because she's a contemporary of Elizabeth. And she reminds me of Elizabeth, the way she's dressed. And also, she's famous for uh, her quote, laugh, with the world, laugh and the world laughs with you, weep and you weep alone. She was born in 1850. She was born on a farm in Janesville, Wisconsin, which isn't too far from here. Her best known poems are poems of passion. She was a popular poet, not a literary poet. Uh, her poems were cheerful, optimistic, plainly written, and they rhyme. And we're gonna see some other poets later on whose poems don't rhyme. None of her works are included in the Oxford Book of American Verse because of the reason that they weren't literary poetry. But 
All of her poems were selected as the best loved poems of American poetry. So a popular poet would be, Amer a popular poet would be people choose her because they love her poetry, the way that it's written, uh, the rhyming, the uh, cheerfulness of it. Literary would be uh, the construct, the way that it is symbolic, maybe has a deeper meaning to it. Uh, it could be, um, it probably is more like the critics. It has more to do with the literary critics, the, uh, those people that are more educated, more skilled. And we'll see it in some of the other work. Uh, we have someone that's one of our staff is going to read a poem, a poem that will identify uh, what that looks like, the literary piece. Um, for instance, I'm talking about her poetry. Sinclair Lewis, who's a famous poet, referred to her poet, poetry as some of the worst poetry he'd ever read. <laughs> One of her most enduring works is Solitude. Solitude is the poem which laugh and the world laughs with you, cry and you cry alone. That was written when she was traveling uh, to a governor's uh, ball and there was a woman traveling with her who was weeping in, in the carriage. And she was overcome with how this widow was crying and weeping. And when she got to the ball, she was overcome with how sad this was that she had to write about it. So she wrote the poem, Solitude. And out of that came this quote. She was very famous. She sold the poem to uh, the paper, The Sun, and received $5 for the poem. <laughs> Doesn't seem like much, does it? She was married to uh, Robert Wilcox, and they made a commitment to each other that whichever one died first, that they would try to reach each other uh, th through um, communication. So she really got into this uh, afterlife of trying to communicate with her husband, Robert, who died. And she was very overcome with the fact that she was never able to communicate with him. So she traveled to California and met with an astrologer, Max Hindle, who was part of the Rastakurian movement. I don't know whether you've ever heard of that. And was very upset that she could not communicate with Robert. And he told her that she needed to calm down, that uh, when you throw a pebble in the water, uh, what happens is all the motion that happens after that, you need to settle like the rock does and the water does and wait for him to communicate with her. Well, he never did. And some of her poems reflect that. <laughs> and later on, she uh, wrote something about that. And it really does stand out. I want to read it to you. As we think, act, and live here today, we build the structures of our homes in spirit realms after we leave the earth. And we build karma for the future lives, thousands of years to come. On this earth or other planets, life will assume new dignity and labor new interests for us. When we come to the knowledge that death is but a continuation of life and labor, in higher planes. Think on these things. I thought that was kind of interesting. She died of cancer in 1919. So she really was a contemporary of Elizabeth. The next poet is Sarah Teasdale. She's probably one of my favorites. She was born in St. Louis to a strict Baptist domineering Victorian family. Uh, they were a very well-to-do family. Uh, she was born to uh, older parents. She was never allowed to play with children. Her mother was very controlling. She considered her frail and every minor illness. 
she had her mother uh, brought her home from school and it was a medical crisis. Uh, she was educated at home until she went to a prestigious college that was founded by T.S. Eliot's grandfather, who, were, who was also a famous writer. She joined a, a writer's club uh, at that college, which was an intellectual discussion group. Her parents, uh, her, her ancestors, uh, actually settled Concord, Massachusetts. They were presidents of Harvard University and signers of the Declaration of Independence. So she comes from a very strong line of, uh, of ancestors. Uh, she was very dependent on her family. Uh, 23 years old, she was still living at home. In 1910, she went to New York and joined a, a writer's group. And she wrote her famous poem, uh, Union Square, in which she describes the plight of a young woman her age, that she wanted to meet a man, but she couldn't initiate a relationship because decent young women do not do that. And this was her own personal internal conflict. Much of her poems are about that conflict. In her first poem she wrote was Emeris. She writes uh, about a woman who will live and die without the one thing that she craved of God and pleads with God to send, not send me back to death unsatisfied. Uh, she won the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry in 1918. Her book, it was called Love Songs. Much of her poetry is about her inner conflict uh, for the lack of finding the love that she wanted and the longing that was unsatisfied. She did have a relationship. She did marry, but she was never satisfied. Much of her poetry is about that. Uh, in 1933, she died of suicide. Her poetry is beautiful, though. Uh, I have a book called Dark Side of the Moon, which was very famous. I have it back there. It's a beautiful book of poetry. But it's just tragic that she took her own life. Our next uh, poet is Sylvia Plath who has been described as a first poet that really starts what's called confessional uh, poetry. She was born in 1932 to uh, Austrian descendant parents. Her father was a professor in Bo in, at Boston University. Her father died when Sylvia was eight years old. Her first poetry was published when she was eight years old. Uh, in the Boston Herald, uh, Sylvia had an IQ of 160. So we're talking about a girl that has a an, an, an high intelligence. Uh, she had, her father died when she was eight years old. And this is an important event in this child's life. She attended uh, Smith College. Not only her, but several of these poets attend Smith College. Uh, and she was asked, uh, wrote a magazine article for uh, Madame, Mademoiselle and <clears throat> was accepted uh, to be the series editor, college editor there, where she went to New York City and was accepted to be a junior editor there. During the time that she was there, there was an incredible number of uh, pressure there to produce. Uh, and she was very much a, uh, had a lot of pressure on herself to, to write and do a good job. And so some rejections at Mademoiselle, uh, news, at Mademoiselle paper led to her uh, in feeling very rejected. And this happens to be, this experience is the basis for a famous book that she wrote called The Bell Jar. She recovered and she went back to Smith College where she graduated magna cum laude uh, and won a Fulbright, Fulbright scholarship to the University of Cambridge in England. I mean, this, this is an incredibly bright young woman. 
So she went to that college where she met her, her husband, Ted Hughes, who is a famous poet as well. And over the next five years, she wrote uh, her novel, The Bell Jar, based on her experience uh, that she went through earlier. And her first book of poetry called Colossus was written, which is a famous book of poetry. She had her first child uh, and uh, had an, a miscarriage. Her second child was born a, <clears throat> a year later, and she wrote another book of poems called Ariel. In the winter of 1963, she found that her husband was having an affair with a good friend of hers. So she moved out and uh, took a, uh, an apartment in London uh, with her two small children. Ted Hughes inherited all of her poetry, published it, and in 1991, she won the uh, posthumously awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. I, uh, at this time, I'm going to let Dre read one of her poems called Lady Lazarus. I have done it again. One year in every 10, I manage it. A sort of walking miracle in my skin, bright as a Nazi lampshade, my right foot a paperweight, my face a featureless fine Jew linen. Peel off the napkin, oh my enemy. Do I terrify? The nose, the eye pits, the full set of teeth, the sour breath will vanish in a day. Soon, soon the flesh, the grave cave eight will be at home on me, and I am a smiling woman. I'm only 30, and like the cat, I have nine times to die. This is number three. What a trash to annihilate each decade. What a million filaments. The peanut crunching crowd shoves in to see them unwrap me, hand and foot, the big strip tees. Gentlemen, ladies, these are my hands, my knees. I may be skin and bone, nevertheless, I am the same identical woman. The first time it happened, I was 10. It was an accident. The second time, I meant to last it out and not come back at all. I rocked shut as a seashell. They had to call and call and pick the worms off me like sticky pearls. Dying is an art like everything else. I do it exceptionally well. I do it so it feels like hell. I do it so it feels real. I guess you could say I have a call. It's easy enough to do it in a cell. It's easy enough to do it and stay put. It's the theatrical comeback in broad day to the same place, the same face, the same brute, amused shout, a miracle that knocks me out. There is a charge for the eyeing of my scars. There is a charge for the hearing of my heart. It really goes. And there is a charge, a very large charge, for a word or a touch or a bit of blood or a piece of my hair or my clothes. So, so, hair doctor, so, hair enemy. I am your opus. I am your valuable, the pure gold baby that melts to a shriek. I turn and burn. Do not think I underestimate your great concern. Ash, ash, you, sp uh, you poke and stir. Flesh, bone, there is nothing there. A cake of soap, a wedding ring, a gold filling. Hair God, hair Lucifer, beware, beware. Out of the ash, I rise with my red hair, and I eat men oh like much. hair. With that, some critics have said Sylvia was patron saint of self-dramatization and of self-pity. One has to read her poetry and her life history and the lack of treatment and understanding of genetic-related chronic mental illness concerns. Sylvia Plath is very, very well known in the world, and there's quite a, a long list of followers uh, for her. Now, that's a really good example of the literary uh, piece. And you could take it apart stanza by stanza if we wanted to and had time, but we don't have time. Our next poet is one of my favorites too, Anne Morrow Lindbergh. I'm sure you've all heard of her. Uh, she was born in 1906. She, her father uh, was a famous man. He was uh, the ambassador to Mexico, uh, a senator from New Jersey, and also a partner in J.P. Morgan uh, a Company. Her mother was the president of Smith College. This is a very prominent family that she was born into, very wealthy family. Uh, she loved to write. 
uh, and she was an English major who graduated with honors from Smith College as well and winning many prizes for her poetry. Uh, when her father was the ambassador to Mexico in 1927, she was a young debutante and she met this really good looking uh, aviator named Charles Lindbergh. <laughs> And uh, he was America's most eligible bachelor. And so uh, she fell in love and uh, married him. And she was considered one of the luckiest women in the world. I've read her autobiography. Uh, they were very private people, very private couple, but they were hounded by the press. And when they moved to England, this is where she began to write again. And she began to write poetry. Uh, some of her poetry that she wrote was a catharsis because of the loss of her child and this horrible experience that she went, went through. I've read some of her journals uh, from this time period, and the reason uh, I started reading her was because I was reading about Amelia Earhart, and they, uh, I came across her name. So I started reading about her, and so I read her books, and during my own soul searching and my own personal tragedy I had had in my life, I, I started to read about her and her journals and her own soul searching were refreshing and uplifting for myself. And uh, some say that her journals are like reading a Bronte novel, and I agree. Some of her most famous poems uh, Un Unicorn in Captivity is the most famous one. I was too long to put on here, but uh, you might want to read it. That's the most famous one, Interior Tree, Bear Tree. Uh, some of her other books that you might like to read are Gift from the Sea. Mary Oliver. Mary Oliver. She's just, she was born in 1935. She died in 2019. She was born in a suburb of Ohio. Her father was a social studies teacher. Uh, she is amazing. I can't say enough about her. Uh, she's also a Pulitzer Prize winning author. Uh, she's one of the most read poets today. Uh, she. She was interviewed by uh, Maria Shriver in, uh, in 2011, and she goes on uh, about growing up in a dysfunctional family. Uh, she also uh, talks about being sexually abused as a child, which led to some of her reasons for her poetry. Uh, she attended the Interlock and Music Camp. She was uh, a drummer. And um, later on in her life, at 17, she visited the home of the Pulitzer Prize winning author Edna St. Vincent Millay. She organized the papers, uh, some of the papers for Edna St. Vincent Millay, and she was very much influenced by her. She attended Vassar College. Many of these authors went to some really amazing colleges. Uh, she taught at various colleges through her life, Case Western, Bucknell University, Sweetbriar College. Uh, she has won the American Poet National Book Award uh, in a, uh, and her fifth work, American Primitive, won the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. Her work is inspired by nature uh, <clears throat> rather than human world. It stems from her passion for walks in the wild. She was inspired by Whitman and Thoreau. And when life is over, she says, I want to say all my life, I was, I was a bride married to amazement. I was the bridegroom taking the world into my arms. She's been compared to Emily Dickinson because she loves solitude and inner conversation. In 2007, New York Times said, far and away, this is the country's best-selling poet. Her, in her personal life, she met Molly Malone Cook, who was her lesbian partner for 40 years, and they lived in Province, Provincetown, Massachusetts. Few feminists have wholeheartedly appreciated Oliver's work, and the, some critics have read her poems as revolutionary views of the human subject. 
Others remain skeptical that identification with nature can empower women, and gay and lesbian women debate this in this area. Uh, she was a she was a kind of a kind of a leader in in that area. Mary Oliver died January 2019 at the age of 83. Oliver opens our eyes to the nature within to its wild and its quiet, with startling clarity, humor, and kindness. A Thousand Mornings, a beautiful book about nature, explores the mysteries of our daily experience. Mm -hmm.